It's an incredibly unique phenomenon and, and a regional phenomenon. There's only a, a couple places in the world that can boast having a monsoonal climate, and we end up happening to be one of them. It's so many things. It's, it's emotional. It's ecological. It's urban infrastructure. I think we should expect the unexpected with the monsoon. This week on Arizona Illustrated, a reflection on this year's monsoon. Welcome to Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. We've had a doozy of a monsoon in southern Arizona this year. We're already above normal rainfall, and I'm wondering now if there's more to come. But what is it, this weather phenomenon that we experience every year? Well, put in its simplest terms, it's a seasonal shift in the direction of the prevailing winds. Now that ushers in tropical moisture, and that combined with our scorching summer heat becomes a powerful force. We're into April, we know that winter's over, the sun's getting higher, it's drying out, it's getting windy, your skin's starting to crack, and then you get into June. Weather forecasters are predicting another sunny and hot day for the Tucson area. Tucson tied a daily record high on Monday and broke daily records Tuesday and Wednesday. With a forecast high of 116 degrees, which would be the second day in a row of hitting that temperature as our heat wave continues. The days are getting as long as they're ever going to get. Stuff starts catching on fire. The borough fire grew by about 4,000 acres overnight Tuesday. The 40,000 acre sawmill fire continues to burn southeast of Tucson. It's kind of a race between the moisture and the heat. But it could be a sign that the summer's rainy season is just around the corner. Dry, dusty wind, heat, and fire makes us all anxious for the monsoon to arrive. The desert heat gets so extreme that some pray for rain and have been doing so for decades. June 24th is the Catholic feast day of St. John the Baptist, and according to local tradition, this day helps mark the beginning of our monsoon with a community celebration and prayers for rain. Con eso les quiero dar las gracias. Thank you so much for being here. We're really happy that this tradition is going to continue. Les seguimos. Muchísimas gracias. This is the 20th annual El Dia de San Juan Festival at Mercado San Agustin on Tucson's west side. The celebration begins with a procession. Father Shaori Nara from St. Augustine Cathedral in downtown Tucson offers his blessings. Give us grace and strength and accompany us today with your angels and saints. And with these processions, we may explore more and more your grace and your power and strength. This year, I think we should be walking on our knees, begging for rain, for the monsoons to come soon. Maribel Alvarez is a professor of anthropology at the University of Arizona. Summer rains are so much a part of the history and the cycle of life of the desert the blessings of water that is so essential for sustaining life in an arid land, but a land that is also so generous and so wonderful to all of us. While this year was billed as the 20th annual El Dia de San Juan Fiesta, there are local headlines about the celebration dating back as far as the 1800s. It's kind of nice to be with other people who want to share that spiritual belief and that sort of sense of positive energy about how important water is and how we have to take care of our resources. For the harvesting, for drinking, for livelihood, the water is the main source of the living. So that's why they are petitioning God to shower the blessings from heaven in the form of rain. <laughs> Surely, I believe, uh, very soon we are going to get monsoons and the rain especially after this festival.
According to the National Weather Service, 2016 tied 2014 for the hottest year on record in Tucson. And according to NASA, 2016 was also the hottest year on record for the entire planet. As you can well imagine, in the middle of the summer, where we are standing today, it has been a very, very warm day, but people still come out to celebrate this tradition. Gene Einfrank is president of the Menlo Park Neighborhood Association and one of the event organizers. This is an event that is not easy to pull off because the first thing that comes to people's mind is it's going to be 110 degrees on June 24th. So in a way, that's sort of a showstopper. The Toronto Autumn people and the Mexican-American community have really taken heart to that tradition year after year. and. Sometimes uh, it works, <laughs> and the rain comes a little bit sooner. I hope so, we need it. Local celebrants are hopeful, but as each year passes, understandably concerned. Gotta have the rain, and I think every year we think it might not happen, um, but, it, but it always does, more or less. Now that we are the city of gastronomy, sometimes we forget that that's what really makes us distinct and unique, that sense of resiliency and uh, innovation and a real passion for using the land and the resources with a little bit of rain at a time. For me and for certainly all of my neighbors, it's just a life-giving feeling. To, to experience the first rain, and we, we celebrate it. While they prayed for rain in June, record-breaking temperatures persisted, and it seemed like the monsoon might not come at all. But then, big, beautiful clouds rising above the mountains were a visual cue that something was coming. It's such a stark shift from the heat of June into that first day where you start to feel in the morning that it gets a little bit sticky out, and then you know we're just around the corner. The sun is beating down on the uh, mountains. They become unstable very, very quickly. They'll start to put up those nice plumes of clouds, and you'll see those storms typically form over the mountains by noon and then we wait to see if there's gonna be enough wind flows in the atmosphere and then also what we call outflows, which is the cool air flowing out of those storms to move down in the valleys. And then we need that mechanism to actually push up the thunderstorm clouds in the valley locations. Uh, it's actually pretty refreshing <laughs> in more ways than one. We get these alerts from rain all the time and nothing happens and then all of a sudden it just comes out of nowhere. It's a lot. It's a lot more all at once for sure. I've never seen so much rain come down all at the same time. The last like, storm that we had, it turned over a bunch of trees over where I live in my neighborhood. The sewage system here sucks because this flooding shouldn't be like this. Once it came in, we started to have epic storm after epic storm after epic storm. So these, these thunderstorms were just stacking up day after day in the Tucson area in particular, and then put us up to record levels. The strong heat wave that hit the area in June and early July helped set up atmospheric conditions that created a wet start to the summer rain season. Water has amazing power. We don't have the respect that we probably need to have for water. Water is relentless. It doesn't stop. It's a constant force. It won't let up. When I see storms like this, I think, yeah, they're, they're, they're cool and they're neat, but I think, what call am I going to get now?
My name is Deputy Jeremy Ramirez. I am a deputy with the Pima County Sheriff's Department. My current assignment is with the Search and Rescue Unit. There's seven deputies and a sergeant for all of Pima County for our Search and Rescue Unit. So once we get a major call working, there's just physically not enough of us. Uh, swift water, I think, is one of the most dangerous things that we do, but there's always a little bit of worry as far as what can happen because a lot of it's unknown. Even when you're there, you, you don't always know exactly what's going on with everything. Currently, we're going to head to the Tank Verde Falls area just to see if there's any water flowing, how much is flowing, and how many people might be out there right now uh, with the storms that are possibly looming to the east of us that might drain into the falls area. One of the search rescue deputies will take the lead and we'll try to call the scene to try to get first-hand information. I want to know where the person is, if they're on what we can consider the, the near side or the far side of the stream, how much imminent danger they may be in. It can be any, anything from there's absolutely nothing wrong with them, they just don't know where they are, to where they wind up dying on you. That was a pretty intense call, just from the fact that how many people we had and the number of people that were in imminent danger of, of potentially dying. Behind the tree, you can't see, but the father actually has his four-year-old child on his shoulders. There's two individuals that we could not get to that night, and we had a team of Sarah members walking in, so we waited for first light. You can see it's pretty tough to find somebody. It's raining southeast of us right now, maybe down by Mescal area. I'm not really sure off along I-10. It might move up here, we'll see. So the first one we're going to is the landing zone and we'll look down, you can see the main falls and see if, if there's anybody down there and how much water's flowing. You guys going down or did you come back up or what? How was it down there? All right, cool guys, thank you. This is residual from a couple days ago even and it's still flowing pretty good. So if we do get another storm up a little bit higher, the ground is still relatively saturated. And then on top of that, depending on where it rains, there's been fires in the Catalinas and in the Rincons. That affects how fast and where the drainage and the runoff will go to as well. Depending on where it goes, we could have anywhere from an hour, we could have a couple of hours to half an hour to get people out of there. Personally, I'm not the greatest fan of the monsoons. I know we need the rain, I like the rain, I don't mind it. It's just work related. Sometimes the people that put themselves in positions they probably shouldn't even be in in the first place um, because they know the warnings, they hear the warnings every year. It's put out as public safety announcements. Uh, everybody talks about it, it, it seems so, but we still get the folks that still inevitably they either want to see the monsoons or they don't think it'll happen to them. It's the it won't happen to me syndrome or I know what I'm doing. I know my capabilities. I know my limits. We get that every year. I really do actually enjoy my job being a search and rescue deputy. I may not enjoy the monsoon season so much, but overall my, jo my job, I, I really do enjoy it. It was not what I planned to do. I have a degree in the sciences and that's what I plan to do, work for the Forest Service or something along those lines. And this opportunity came up and I took a job and here I am 18 and a half years later, still doing it. Some of the search rescue calls we get, they're challenges, they're, they're mysteries. Sometimes when there's a missing person, you can't, you honestly you don't know where they are. You have an idea of some things and some models that you follow with some lost person behavior and just some instinct and as well as your training. So that it keeps you going on it. Plus it's something different pretty much every day. Not every rescue has a happy ending, and in some tragic cases, lives are lost. 
Back on Saturday afternoon, July 15th, a family of 14 gathered for a birthday party at a popular swimming hole near Payson, Arizona. The wall of water and debris came barreling down. Ellison a thunderstorm Creek hit Ellison Creek eight miles upstream, and a huge wall of water and debris moved through the canyon, quickly overtaking them. Nine family members perished, six of them children. The youngest was two years old. So as we welcome and celebrate the monsoon, we're also mindful of the lives lost and the heartbreak of survivors. But in its taking, it also gives. The monsoon rains bring new life and are vital for all living things in this desert. In the average monsoon season, total rainfall is 6.09. So we're even running above the normal for the season. National Weather Service meteorologist Jeff Davis says this is the rainiest July ever and the second wettest month on record. From an ecology standpoint and a water resources standpoint, having that, that precip in July a little bit earlier is going to help stuff grow much quicker and respond to that water and then um, lengthens the growing season when we think about some of the vegetation that responds to this summer, summer rainfall. The plants and animals have evolved to really utilize the monsoon. We have a lot of plants that require that pulse of summer rain to, to move through phenology and life cycles and put out flowers. There are many life forms that rely on the monsoon. One of the first things we hear, but rarely see, also happens to be the loudest. They're out there, they're all over the place, they're on all the trees and bushes and such, but they're very hard to find because they have what appears to be good vision. When you come up to a tree, they'll either stop calling immediately or if they see you, sometimes they'll move their body around the tree to avoid you seeing them. Sometimes they're hard to key in on what, from their noise that they're making because it can be so loud, it's hard to tell where it's actually coming from. People mention often like whenever they hear cicadas, they make it sound like it's hotter outside or feels hotter outside. That's usually because they're out at the hottest, driest part of the day. They start emerging in June before the monsoons hit. When the conditions are right, the um, nymphal stage, the immature stage, leaves the ground, finds a place to crawl up to, and then the adult stage emerges from that nymphal stage. And that usually happens in the evening after dark. We have approximately four dozen species that occur in the state. The most common species that we encounter in our area is the Apache cicada, Diceroprocta apache, and that's the one that we hear most of the time in Tucson. They're grayish black and they have yellow markings on them. They're what we hear during the day when we hear the loud, whirling, buzzing sound. Only the males make the sound and they have a structure underneath called a timbre. By flexing that with muscles back and forth, it produces a sound and it's amplified by the hollowed out body cavity of the abdomen of the male. The sound is used to attract females and to compete with sound of other males. And it's also as a defensive mechanism too. Each species has its own sound, its own call, so to speak. The purpose of cicadas, as the ultimate purpose for most organisms, is to reproduce. And, but they also feed other animals too. Birds feed on them. Mammals feed on them, reptiles feed on them, and so they provide a pretty nutritious, healthy food source for other organisms. They're just another beautiful part of the biodiversity in our region. Arizona, especially southeastern Arizona, has the highest amount of insect and other arthropod diversity than any other part of the country. To me, it's kind of like the beginning of summer. I sort of look forward to hearing the first buzz that I hear. I kind of note that when it happens because for me that's kind of the uh, beginning of a season for insects to start showing up here in the desert region. For a plant lover like myself, 
The summer rains are just an incredibly special time because we get this diverse palette of plants that you don't see the rest of the year. The Arizona summer poppy is one of the annuals people are seeing a lot of this summer. It's along roadsides in some of the valleys. And even though it's called a poppy, it is not related to the Mexican gold poppies that we see in the springtime. This is completely unrelated and it's closely related to creosote bush. They don't open until an hour or two after sunrise. That flower, once open, is pollinated and will not open again the second day. The flowers are very interesting on these. They're five petals and orange to our vision, but the neat thing is that we cannot see ultraviolet light, and if we could, like the insects that pollinate it, you would see these nectar guides, these lines that draw the insect towards the center of the plant where there's not only nectar, but the pollen that needs to be transferred from flower to flower. So the Arizona summer poppy has some pretty specific needs as far as where it's going to grow. And that's based on soil type and water availability. We often see them along roads because roads are just like umbrellas. They shed water off to the sides. So even in less than optimal rain years, you'll get summer poppies along the road. If the rains are really good, you'll get them way out into the desert. Just by indications of how many plants we're seeing that tells us, without even checking the rain gauge, that this was a pretty good monsoon. Most people in Tucson are familiar with these green fig beetles, and some people call them June beetles. Uh, Common names are a little confusing because different people from different regions use them differently, but uh, the, we call them fig beetles here, um, and the genus is Cotinus, uh, the species of Mutabilis. They're beautiful beetles. The, the bottom side is brilliant metallic green, and the top side is kind of this matte uh, velvet kind of green with a yellow fringe. Bright purpley black wings, and uh, this is one of the beetles that, uh, before there were video games, the kids would entertain themselves by tying a thread to their leg and buzzing them around. <laughs> so it's, it's the original handheld video game. <laughs> the larval stage is how they spend most of their life. They're a big grub that lives in the soil, and they're, they're detritivores. They just help decompose things. So this C-shaped grub is a typical um, scarab beetle larva. And then the moving on its back like this is, is usually indicates this is a fig beetle larva. The adult stage is rather short-lived. They pupate after they've become a full-size grub, and then they emerge when the rain, rains hit and buzz around. And the only detrimental thing about them is that they attack fruits. They're called fig beetles because that's the, sort of their preference is figs. Um, but they like any soft fruit, like stone fruits, peaches, and plums. And in the desert, their native food is probably prickly pear fruit. But we've conveniently offered all these other buffet items in our gardens. And so that's really the only downside of this beautiful animal is, is it does eat our fruit. And it's very good at eating our fruit. So the only thing you can do is really bag the fruit if you really want your fruit in the desert. Organisms on the planet really respond to the monsoons and the moisture. And it's the time when they're happiest. You can almost feel their glee as, you're <laughs> as the rains come. <laughs> All the animals and plants get pretty excited in the desert. We need water to live. Water is sacred to us. The water is life. My name is Phyllis Valenzuela, and I'm a member of the Tauna Autumn Nation. I live here in Sanavir. Our ancestors relied on the monsoon for their farming to water the fields. 
I cook here at the farm and everything I cook with is grown here. So most of my dishes are vegetarian. I harvest off of the land at different seasons. A monsoon is my favorite and it's given us some delicious fruit this year. The whirling of the wind, the smell of rain when it hits the ground. It's a smell that you can't smell anywhere else. <laughs> it's me and my grandkids will sit outside and we'll look at the clouds and see figures in there. So far, we've seen a bear sitting there with like a honey pot, fishes. My favorite one that I've seen to the south, there was these clouds coming out and they looked like people standing in a row. When the rain stops, there's animals that come out, ants especially. I've seen rabbits, a family of quail. I even had a visit from a hawk sitting in my front yard. <laughs> the monsoon in July was spectacular and powerful, and in some cases, destructive. But for the most part, it was a welcome break from the summer heat and a breathed new life into the desert. Now we're waiting to see what it's got left in the tank. I don't know about you, but I'm hoping for more rain. It's had a lot of drama, let's just put it that way. It's had cliffhangers around every corner, which, you know, having that late start, and then it goes for three weeks, sets a record, and now we have a downturn. That would be the thing that would be kind of a bummer about the season, is to do an epic July, and then to do an epically dry August and September, and then kind of just be above average at the end of the season. <laughs> that would be a little bit, that'd be cruel, I think. Because I want to go for the gusto now. Let's try to do it again in August and do it in September. I just like water. I had no idea. I'm just obsessed with the river then. I just thought it was cool. Maybe it's just a boy thing. <laughs> it's just a wonderful sight to see like the different um, lightning strikes in the skies and the views and the sunsets. So I like this time of the year. Thank you for joining us here on Arizona Illustrated. I'm Tom McNamara. See you soon.